Through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Here beginneth the prophetic lesson from the 10th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God, the earth also with all that therein is. Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, <coughs> as it is this day. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. He doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and the widow, and loveth the stranger, in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. He is thy praise, and he is thy God, that hath done for thee these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. Thy fathers went down into Egypt with threescore and ten persons, and now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude. Therefore, thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and keep his charge, and his statutes, and his judgments, and his commandments alway. Here endeth the lesson. Thanks be to God. Thou art the God that doeth wonders. And thus declare thy power among the people. Thou hast mightily delivered thy people. 
And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long in this time. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail, whether there be tongues, they shall cease, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but I but when I became a man, I put away childish things. But now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Here in it, the epistle. Thanks be to God. <laughs> oh, be joyful in the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. before his presence with a song. Be ye sure that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. The continuation of the Holy Ghost according to St. Luke. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Then Jesus took unto him the twelve, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For ye shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on, and they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things, but the saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. And it came to pass <clears> that <throat> as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging, and hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by, and he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him that he should not to 
wirklich Tod ist dies, für die Kreuz und was der Mord, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight, thy faith hath saved thee. And immediately he received his sight, and found him glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. Praise be to thee, O Father and the Son. 
Welcome all on this Quinquagesima Sunday, the Sunday next before Lent. Uh, before proceeding with the sermon for this morning, uh, my apologies if my chanting on this Sunday is about half the strength that it normally is. I spent much the last week coughing, and coughing does wonders to one's voice box. So I am uh, doing my best, but sometimes I miss the high notes at this point. Um, but I can assure you that I'm not, I no longer have a cold, I'm not contagious. Hopefully I'm only contagious with the Holy Spirit at this point. So, um, as you know, we are quickly upon Lent. Uh, in fact, Lent officially begins this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. So, um, if you are available, uh, please do come for Ash Wednesday service in order to receive the imposition of ashes. We shall be having two masses on Ash Wednesday, one at uh, one o'clock in the afternoon, uh, and also at seven o'clock in the evening. So uh, if you come to either, either mass in order to receive um, the imposition of ashes for Ash Wednesday, uh, please do so. Again, one o'clock or seven o'clock on that day. The night before on Shrove Tuesday, we shall be having our Shrove Tuesday Pancake Supper here uh, in celebration of the last evening before the 40 days of Lent. So if you would like to come for the Pancake Supper, you are welcome, all are invited, and uh, it begins downstairs at seven o'clock in the evening. I know that Brian here will be at the griddle cooking pancakes. He is our pancake master, and I will be doing the sausages, I believe, again this year. So, uh, but please do come if you would like to do so Tuesday evening at seven o'clock downstairs. And just as a reminder, our front door is closed in the evenings. So the way to come into the church is through the back gate uh, right off of the parking lot behind us. So that would be the way to enter into the premises uh, on Tuesday evening if you would like to come for the, um, for the pancake supper. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. My brothers and sisters, in Christ Jesus, blessings and peace on this Quinquagesima Sunday. In today's Gospel, we behold a blind man begging off to the side as Jesus and his followers pass. It is important to note that as much as the man is physically blind, he is also socially cast out from the community. He is not a part of a family structure that supports him. And for that reason, the blind man has to beg for his basic needs. Now, we see blind beggars in our time, but we also see that there are social advocates for them. Today, there are lawyers, funded and organized, in order to defend their rights. There is social welfare that provides at least a subsistence life. There are medical clinics that serve the specific interests of the disabled and the poor. But in the first century, nothing like this at all exists. The blind beggar cast away from society is literally left to die on the streets. And while he is in the process of slowly withering away, he is told in so many ways that he can speak his mind no more than he can see. He is to speak no more than he can see. In other words, he is to remain silent in his misery. Since it was the common view then that a man is disabled on account of a specific sin that he or his fathers had committed, and that the disability is divine judgment for wrongfulness. So therefore that cursed soul, it was thought, should not inflict his misery upon passers-by. He should not call attention to himself because in a way that was like calling attention to his sin. In the first century mind, 
Permitting the personification of sin to speak aloud and then responding to that person is almost like normalizing sin. That is how people thought of it. For people of that time, sin is not a condition to be overcome by love, but rather a condition to be swept under the rug. If it is not seen nor ever acknowledged, then perhaps that sin does not exist. The Christian faith completely reverses that mindset. The Christian faith completely reverses that mindset. Christ Jesus takes on all of our sins, literally, in his sacrifice on the cross. The one man without sin becomes on the cross the personification of our sinfulness, so that our sinfulness dies with him on that same cross. Our sinfulness, then, is overcome by his love for us. This is why we have crucifixes, Christ on the cross. They remind us that in Christ Jesus, love overcomes sin. It is not that sin is swept under the rug and no longer acknowledged. Christ Jesus, in his resurrected flesh after all, still has the wounds from the cross. Rather, where love is sufficient, sin is rendered inert. It is no longer a temptation to further sins. It is no longer that spiritual disease that perverts the inner compass and steers a person's life towards the beaches of hell. Rendered inert like the wounds of our Lord's resurrected flesh. Sin reminds us of what love has overcome. Imagine that. Think about that. In this lifetime, we are burdened by our sinfulness. And in the lifetime to come, that same sinfulness, rendered inert, simply serves to remind us of how much more joy we have then. God turns with his mercy what is bad into what is joyful and good. When finally we are completely alive in Christ Jesus and dead to sin, then all of that wretched hardship that we had inflicted upon ourselves by our own sinfulness in this lifetime will serve no other purpose than to remind us how much more joyful it is now that we are freed from all that. It is like being lucid from the ball and chain. Remember Jacob Marley carrying around his ball and chain in the Dickens Christmas. It is like being lucid from the ball and chain, but then keeping that ball and chain on a hook by the door so that every time we step outside into the sun, we remember that that ball and chain has been rendered inert by love. Now the fact that in Christ Jesus, all of our sinfulness will be rendered inert by his love for us that fact does not give us a green light to indulge in as many sins as we can before our life here is done. If we are to be with him then, when our lives are finished, we must try as best as we can to be with him now. To follow his footsteps up to Calvary and to live by his example of sacrificial love for one another. Remember the man who says that he wants to follow Christ Jesus, but who insists first that he must bury his father. This man, in essence, is saying that he first chooses to attend to his old life before choosing Jesus. No doubt, attending to his old life means, among other things, holding on to some of those old sins that he is not just yet ready to let go. It reminds me of that famous prayer of St. Augustine, when he, which he wrote when he's talking about how he converted from paganism to Christianity. It's quite an interesting story. St. Augustine, as a young man, a brilliant young man, was a, a very um, 
shall we say, a licentious, hedonistic, pagan, enjoyed all the fruits of youthful life, shall we say, had a girlfriend, a child out of wedlock, had lots of girlfriends, um, and he was, as his heart was starting to turn towards Christianity, St. Augustine famously said he sat, down in his, he sat down and prayed before God and he said, God, give me the grace, he said, give me the grace to stop with my sinning, but just not yet. Why not yet? Because he was enjoying himself. He was having fun. He was getting a lot of girls. He was a very handsome young man. He wasn't ready yet. He wanted to hold on to his old life a little longer. Maybe the man who wants to hold on to his old life, maybe he has a grudge to settle before he will follow Jesus. Maybe he has an ounce of gold to swindle before he will follow Jesus. Whatever it is, he is not willing to be with Jesus now. And if that mindset persists, he will not be him, be with him when his life here is done. Love overcomes sin. But what does this look like? The best answer is the crucifixion of Christ Jesus. There is no greater icon to love defeating sin than that. Every moment in the Gospels helps us to contemplate the crucifixion. And this brings us to the blind beggar crying out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. This blind beggar sees what most of our Lord's followers then do not yet see, namely, that Jesus is much more than a miracle worker. He is much more than a prophet. He is the one promised by God to King David who will restore the kingship to his throne. Moreover, this restorer will not be a sinful man like David had been, or even Moses. Rather, God himself will be the restorer. As is indicated by Isaiah's prophecy of Emmanuel, which is to say, God is with us. The blind beggar not only identifies Jesus as the son of David, he identifies him as the one who can heal him of his blindness. And only God can do that. Therefore, in essence, the blind beggar is crying out, Jesus Christ is God. That's what he's saying. He is professing the most profound faith in a world that demands that he remain silent. How often does the world tell us to remain silent about our faith? How often do we remain silent in order to avoid all the persecutions the world can dish out at us simply for being Christians? It would be considerably easier for the blind beggar to remain silent as Christ Jesus passes by. He would not be healed, but then again his blindness is more familiar to him. How often do we hold on to our old ways of living, which frankly are more familiar to us than to risk persecution here and now for the, for the possibility of embracing a real joy? Most often, truth be told, we settle for a life that is not particularly good, a life of compromises and a life scarred by old familiar sins. But by contrast, love does not settle. Love breaks through the chains. Love speaks in a loud voice when urged to be silent. Love gives up everything for the object of love, as our Lord does on the cross at Calvary. The blind beggar helps us to contemplate the crucifixion, for he is helping us to contemplate the mystery of what love is. My brethren, as we approach Lent, let us ponder in our minds and in our hearts what love really is. And let us be courageous in crying out to the one we love. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.
Jesus. We offer this Mass on this Quinquagesima Sunday in veneration of the most blessed and ever virgin mother of God, Mary, patroness of all the faithful and of this church. We also offer this Mass in veneration of all the saints, those saints still alive among us now, and those who have passed on to the greater glory of God, the church militant and the church triumphant. We also offer in silence those prayers which we keep closest to our hearts. Prayers of petition, intercession, and thanksgiving. Acknowledging that those prayers which we keep closest to our hearts and which we offer in silence under this altar will by Christ and the cross be made an acceptable sacrifice unto the Father in heaven. We also pray for all those persons suffering in war-torn parts of the world Israel and Gaza, in Ukraine, and in other parts of the world. We pray for the innocents, that they may be able to return to their families and their homes in peace. We pray for all those persons suffering from physical, emotional, or spiritual disease. We pray for the hungry, the homeless, the afflicted. We pray for those persons suffering from addiction, those persons who have been abandoned those persons who are hated because of who they are. We pray for those persons who are suffering from misguided teachings, cults, or heresies. We pray for those persons who do not know, know the love of Christ in their lives. And we pray for the most vulnerable among us, the aged, the infirm, and the unborn. We also pray, most especially, Chris, Langley, Laura, Linda, Maria, Marilyn, Marius, Mary, Matthew, Michael, Nadia, Naima, and Nicholas. Heart in peace. Thanks be to God. The peace of God which passeth all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. The Lord be with you. The beginning of the Holy Gospel. According to St. John, Glory be to the Lord. in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the light was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for witness, to bear witness of light. And all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighted every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came out of his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh 